Well, today we are continuing our series on Galatians. And Galatians, as we've already been told, Galatians is the reminder of the simple yet profound nature of the gospel, the good news of Jesus and what he's done. And as we've been encouraged to read through Galatians, I hope that God has been revealing things to you that perhaps you haven't noticed before. Or you've been reminded of the things that keep you on the path that he's got you on. I've found reading Galatians um, a little bit of a challenge, actually, to, you know, to be honest. Um, Paul's, Paul's writing style is a little bit difficult to follow. He tends to talk in circles a lot and then change the subject out of nowhere. But what it does, it, it helps me, it, it actually it forces me to slow down. And to really think about what Paul is wanting to communicate. Not just read through like I'm in a race to finish. So today we're going to be looking at chapter 3 from Galatians. um, Where again, Paul's readers are reminded of this good news. The reason Paul wrote this letter was because false teachers had infiltrated the church at Galatia. And had begun to preach a different gospel. A false gospel. A gospel which Paul says was no gospel at all, taught by those still clinging to Jewish laws and customs, claiming in order to be right with God, to be accepted by God, you needed to first become a Jew, which meant going through a conversion process via the Jewish rituals, and um, which included and was represented by circumcision. That's That's how your commitment commitment was demonstrated. That's how you know you made the cut, (laughs) so to speak. And when Paul found out about this, he was like, whoa, hang on, hang on. That's not what I taught you at all. And so he wrote to the Galatian church with, with this letter. So let's pick up what Paul is saying in chapter 3. Here we go. Paul writes, You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It's a pretty strong start to this section of the letter. It's a wake-up call to his readers who had been led astray about the way to salvation for lack of thinking and lack of discernment. Enchanted perhaps by the smooth talking of charismatic communicators without weighing up three things. What they already knew about Jesus from Paul's teachings and what they knew from their own experience and what they knew about the existing scriptures. Three things. And it's these three things that Paul uses to make his point to the Galatians bringing them back to the central message of his ministry, Jesus' death on a cross. Paul reminds them, before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. So for those new to the story of Christianity or for anyone who needs reminding, here's why the crucifixion of Jesus is central to the gospel message. God is holy God is good, God is love, and God is just. God created a perfect universe, and he created a perfect earth, and God created perfect people for the purpose of living in eternal relationship with him. God gave people free will because real love is not imposed. It is offered as a choice. Even though God and God's holy way of living was the best choice, People rejected God and chose their own way instead. That choice, known as sin, separated humankind from God because God is holy. Holiness and sin don't mix. Righteousness is required to be right with God. That separation resulted in death, not only physically but also spiritually. But God made a promise with a number of people throughout the Old Testament that he would make a way to restore this relationship that sin had destroyed. That way, the only way, was for God to send a Messiah, a Saviour, a Rescuer. 
his own son, Jesus, into this world. But in the meantime, God would establish a nation of his chosen people through which his son would be born into. That nation was Israel. And to set it apart from the behaviour and customs of all the other nations and cultures and religions, God introduced a law system for people to abide by. Because God is perfect, the law would have to be followed perfectly for a person to be declared righteous, to gain right standing with God. But again, because people have been given free will, as much as they tried, instead of choosing God's way, They chose their way, keeping them separated from God. So in addition to the law, God formalized the sacrifice system, where an animal would have to die as a substitute, representing the death that was deserved by a person's rejection of God and his ways. The sacrifice would fill the righteousness gap to enable connection with God once again. All these promises, laws and sacrifices that were put in place were designed as signposts to the coming of the Messiah. The animal sacrifice and law system was always intended to be temporary. But it was a very long temporary, about 1,500 years. But finally, as he promised, God sent Jesus into the world born into the nation that God had set apart. Jesus lived a perfect life. He was fully righteous, obedient to God and all his requirements. But the nation that God chose for his son chose to reject him and crucified him. Unwittingly, playing right into God's amazingly gracious plan for Jesus to become the perfect sacrifice thus doing away with the old sacrifice system for good, fulfilling God's promises, fulfilling the law, fulfilling justice, not just for Israel, but for people everywhere. Jesus died in our place, filling the righteousness gap, filling the gap that we could never fill, opening the way for restoration with God. We are redeemed. We are justified, made righteous in God's sight because of Jesus. The only requirement from us is faith, believing who Jesus is and what he's done for us. Because of Jesus' humility in obeying God to the point of death, God raised him to life, conquering sin and death. And Jesus now provides us with eternal life as well as a new way to live right now. We no longer live for ourselves, but for him. We follow his examples. Before Jesus ascended back to heaven, he made a promise. He would send a helper for every believer to live by faith the life that we've been called to live. That promise was the gift of the Holy Spirit, who guides us along the path of becoming more and more like Jesus a process often referred to as sanctification. To be clear, becoming like Jesus, being kind and loving others and helping people, doing good deeds, doesn't make us right with God. It pleases God for sure, but it doesn't make us right with God. Only faith in Jesus makes us right with God because of his death on the cross. Becoming like Jesus with the help of the Holy Spirit is what we do in response to what Jesus has done for us on the cross. But what we do contributes nothing to our right standing with God. In Romans 3.28, we're reminded that we are made right with God through faith and not by obeying the law. We are justified by faith. We are made right with God through believing Jesus died on a cross in our place for our sin. And we are sanctified by faith. In other words, we are made more like Jesus through believing that the Holy Spirit will help us live out God's plan for our lives, which is to become more like Jesus. Paul sums up this idea neatly in his letter to the Ephesian church. He writes, For it is by grace you have been saved, Through faith. 
And this is not from yourselves, it is a gift of God, not by works or the law, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. So back to the church at Galatia. Paul pinpoints faith in Jesus' death on a cross as the focus for our right standing with God, not following the law as they had been taught. Remember, Paul said, before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. And then if we skip ahead to verse 13, we read that Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written in the Jewish law law book of Deuteronomy, cursed is everyone who is hung on a pole or on a cross. Jesus crucified is one of the main objections that the Jews have to the Christian faith. If Jesus really was the Messiah, how could he possibly die a criminal's death? That was not the image of the glorious saviour that they were expecting. According to their law, he was cursed. But they failed to see that Jesus became a curse for them. He took their place. He took our place and redeemed us. He brought us back to God. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles, that's the non-Jews, through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. We'll get back to Abraham in a second, but let's first see how Paul uses the experience of the Holy Spirit in the church to contradict the false teachers at Galatia. And so he asks a series of rhetorical questions. He says, I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by believing what you had heard? Are you so foolish? After beginning by means of the Spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? Have you experienced so much in vain if it really was in vain? So again I ask, does God give you his Spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? See, we can't begin the Christian journey in the Spirit and then say, I'm right now, God, I'll take it from here. Just sit back and and watch what I can do. We cannot live the Christian life without the power of the Holy Spirit. To continue addressing the false teaching that insisted being Jewish and the belief that following the Jewish law is essential to being made right with God, Paul brings up Abraham, father of the nation of Israel. It's a masterstroke. It's a mic drop moment. Let's not forget that Paul's former occupation was an elite Jewish religious leader. He knew his stuff. It's like he's saying, you want to push this Jewish agenda? Let me give you a lesson in Jewish history, which you've clearly missed. So Paul quotes from Genesis. So so also Abraham believed God. In other words, he had faith in God. And it was credited, credited to him as righteousness, as right standing with God. 430 years before the law came into effect with Moses, starting with the Ten Commandments, you've heard that story, God's faith system was already in place. Abraham hadn't kept the law. The law wasn't even a thing at that point. God gave Abraham a promise Abraham believed the promise and God declared him righteous. Faith is what matters. Paul goes on to write, Understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. So the descendants of Abraham would not just be cultural Jews. They would be people justified by faith. And that includes non-Jews or Gentiles as they're referred to in the Bible. Scripture foresaw, or in other words, it was part of God's plan, that God would justify the Gentiles by faith. 
and announced the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. Paul explains in this passage that the true essence of the promise was that Abraham and his descendants were being blessed and preserved so that through them, Jesus would ultimately come. And when he did, all the spiritual blessings that had been promised would be given to Jesus, not to the nation of Israel, but to Jesus. Jesus would be the recipient of all the blessings. Once Christ had all the blessings, everyone, including Israel, could have access to them through a system of faith. So those who rely on faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. As it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. James also highlights this curse. He writes, Forever who keeps, for whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. It's all or nothing with the law. So why then was the law given at all? It was added because of transgressions until the seed, that's Jesus, to whom the promise referred had come. God was establishing his people. Moses led them out of years of Egyptian slavery. And God was setting them apart from all the other cultures and nations and religions. They were accustomed to Egyptian customs. And they were heading into places where other tribes and nations lived in exact opposition to God. God gave directions to his people the right way to live, to live his way. The law was put into place because of transgressions. That is, people choosing their own way over God's way. The law was given to reveal sin with the aim to limit evil amongst the nation and to reveal the punishment for breaking the law. The law was never meant and never purposed as a means to justification. As mentioned earlier, it was only ever intended as a temporary measure until Jesus, the promised Messiah, came. Paul continues to write, Is there a conflict then between God's law and God's promises? Absolutely not. If the law could give us new life, we could be made right with God by obeying it. But the scriptures declare that we are all prisoners of sin, so we receive God's promise of freedom only by believing In Jesus Christ. The law doesn't change the promise. It works with the promise. It doesn't contradict it. Jesus himself, the ultimate promise, made it clear in Matthew 5.17 when he said that he didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. Jesus was the fulfillment of of the whole Old Testament. From the Garden of Eden in Genesis right through, God put out signposts pointing his people to the coming of Jesus. The Old Testament prophets spoke of a major shake-up to the way things were done. All the history, all the religious forms, structures and positions were all signposts and symbols given ultimate meaning and ultimate fulfilment when Jesus arrived on the scene. For example, the temple. Jesus referred to himself as the true temple that would be destroyed and raised again in three days in John chapter 2. In 1 Corinthians 5, Paul refers to Jesus as the Passover lamb. The role of a priest is no longer needed because we have Jesus, our great high priest, as stated in Hebrews chapter 5. The law that kept guard over God's people has been transferred to Jesus, our guardian, in Galatians 3.24. God's people today, those that Jesus is gathering as his church, are no longer defined by political and ethnic unity as the false teachers in the church at Galatia were promoting. 
We are people from all nations, all ethnicities, scattered amongst all political states and not identified with any one of them. What unites us is our faith in Jesus. The Old Testament law can never make God before us. He is already for us as we continue to put our trust in Christ. No, command, <clears throat> no commandment keeping can make us acceptable to God. We are already accepted in Christ. That shift of focus is life-changing. We live differently in light of God's incredible love for us and his amazing grace that rescues us. Paul writes in his letter, in his letter to the Roman church, But now, by dying to what once bound us, we have been released from the law so that we serve in a new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. We serve in the new way of the Spirit. The commandments can help us discern the path of love, but ultimately our eyes are on Jesus and the example that He set the example that he set for us, living a life of love, humility, grace, and servanthood. So as we head out into our week, may we live with the assurance of salvation through faith. Jesus has done it all. May our fears be stilled. May our striving cease. May we find delight and joy and rest and peace and every blessing that comes from Him and through Him. What an assurance that we have. We can praise our Saviour all the day long because He has brought us back into relationship with God the Father through His death on the cross. As Paul writes in Romans chapter 5, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. If you have questions about anything that you've heard today or you have prayer needs, as always, we'll have people down the front at the end of the service. If you'd like to come down and have a chat, uh, we'd be happy to pray with you, to talk with you. Um, if you're joining us online and you've got questions as well, you can email us at hello at humeridge.church. We'd love to hear from you and we will follow up with you. Um, so yeah, so let's, uh, let's close up our service today in prayer. Would you bow your heads and pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus. May we never lose sight of his finished work on the cross. Help us to remember that when he cried out, it is finished, he really meant it. There is nothing more for us to do except have faith in what He has done. Lord, I pray that You would strengthen our faith. We ask that Your Holy Spirit would open our eyes to those opportunities to live out the love that You have for all people. May our life be a song that sings Your praise every day, all the day long. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.